You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed, finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. Have you ever seen a performance by Cirque du Soleil? How would you categorize it? Is it a circus? Is it theater? The renowned professors of business strategy, Chan Kim and Rene Maborn, argue that it is neither. Cirque du Soleil created something completely new, a category of its own. It didn't try to compete with traditional circuses which target children and families, but neither was it in the same market as theaters catering to ultra-sophisticated audiences. With the rise of modern forms of entertainment, the circus industry was declining. The competition among circuses was becoming ever stronger. Due to higher costs and lower demand, profits were shrinking rapidly. Against this background, Cirque du Soleil combined the best elements of circus and theater, adding its own original creations and discarding everything that was not essential, such as animal acts, expensive star performers, and multiple show arenas. As a result, it could charge several times more for tickets than traditional circuses, significantly reduce its costs, and attract a new kind of customer. In short, by totally reinventing the circus, Cirque du Soleil escaped all competition. It created for itself a blue ocean of virtually unlimited demand. The Cirque story is a key example of a theory which has revolutionized the field of business strategy. It's also the title of Kim and Maborn's best-selling book, Blue Ocean Strategy, How to Create Uncontested Market Space and Make the Competition Irrelevant. First published in 2005, there's a 2015 edition with new examples and updated content. The authors, Chan Kim and Rene Maborn, are professors at INSEAD, the French business school that's on par with Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton. They're considered among the world's top management gurus and run INSEAD's Blue Ocean Strategy Institute. In this book, Insight, we'll explore four main questions which will give us a thorough understanding of the book, which has now sold over 3.5 million copies. First, what is Blue Ocean Strategy and why is it important? Second, how do you find a blue ocean? Third, how do you avoid red ocean traps? And fourth, how can you renew and retain a blue ocean business once you have one? The circus industry was, and remains, a highly competitive and saturated market where many players compete to steal customers from each other. This is what the authors call a red ocean of competition, a market in which firms fight tooth and nail to secure their share of a static or shrinking market. Their bloodied battles turn the waters red. Here's Maborn herself speaking at a World of Business Ideas event. In almost every industry that we could find, and virtually every government today, will tell you that they're operating in the red increasingly. Intense competition, margins are shrinking, harder to get new investments, um, more competition. And we call markets creating strategic moves the blue ocean because the opportunities for all of us out there were unlimited. As Kim and Maborn put it, Red oceans represent all the industries in existence today. This is the known market space. Blue oceans denote all the industries not in existence today. This is the unknown market space. Cirque du Soleil realized that it wouldn't be a good idea to compete with large established circuses, such as Ringling Brothers and Barnum & Bailey. They came up with a new value proposition that eliminated all the unnecessary and costly elements that traditional companies took for granted. It was able to create a blue ocean for itself, a new category of entertainment with virtually no competition. To date, its productions have been seen by over 150 million people in over 300 cities around the world. Having looked at circuses, the authors move on to another example, the U.S. wine industry. Traditionally, players in the American wine industry competed on seven factors. Price, marketing, age of wine, vineyard prestige, 
wine complexity, range of wines, and wine terminology. The more complicated, the better. The industry in the late 1990s was clearly divided between a top tier of premium wines with high price, age, and complexity. Then there was a bottom tier of simple budget wines with low price and low prestige. The vast majority of America's 1,600 wineries pursued either of these two markets, premium or budget wines. As a result, consumers didn't actually have a thousand choices, but effectively only two. Amidst such bloody market competition, there existed an opportunity, a chance for new players to offer a distinctive value innovation. In contrast to traditional strategy theories, which are based on a trade-off between value and cost, the pursuit of blue oceans often means creating a product that is both better in the eyes of the consumer and cheaper. At the same time, the lower costs from carving out a big new market can mean higher profits for the producer. Casella Wines offered a winning value innovation with the introduction of its Yellowtail brand. It was an uncomplicated, pleasant-tasting wine that came in only two versions, white and red, and with no year of vintage. The simple, attractive label featured a yellow kangaroo. The wine was actually made in Australia. Instead of positioning itself as yet another Me Too premium or budget wine and compete for the existing customers, Casella adopted a completely different approach and targeted non-customers. The latter group consisted of people who didn't drink wine but potentially could do so. They included mostly beer and ready-to-drink cocktail consumers as well as novice wine drinkers. Casella found it could steal many customers from the budget wine sector by having them move up to Yellowtail. Surprisingly, it was also able to attract more sophisticated wine drinkers from the premium sector. They appreciated that Yellowtail, while being a fun, easy drink, still had the requisite quality and was much cheaper than the premium wines they were buying. The result? Sales of Yellowtail wines boomed. Casella created a huge new middle market for wines, catering to a demand that no one really knew existed. But Kim and Maborn discuss four crucial actions on the path to product success. Eliminate, reduce, raise, and create. In the case of Yellowtail, it eliminated the complicated wine terminology, which made the average person feel ignorant. There were no words like Cabernet Sauvignon or Malbec or Pinot Grigio on the label. At the same time, it reduced the importance of vineyard prestige, wine complexity, and wine range, leaving only two simple choices, red or white. On the other hand, it created the feeling of fun, easy drinking of quality wine. The result was that Casella could raise the price above budget wines, yet still sell at a price significantly below premium wines. The results were astonishing. Within a decade, Yellowtail became the market leader in the U.S. and one of the top five most powerful wine brands in the world. Kim and Maborn argued that in today's business world, finding blue oceans has never been more important. Firstly, many sectors and industries are inefficient and need a fundamental rethinking. There is no end to demand for new goods and services, even if the demand is as yet unarticulated. Second, information spreads faster than ever before. News about products and services are shared instantly online. Bad or undifferentiated products cannot hide from low-star ratings, thumbs down, or negative comments. To sell anything, you must offer something that's inherently better and different to everything else. Network effects mean that the public quickly gravitate to such products and services and desert those that come up short. In this section, we began our dive into Blue Ocean Strategy by W. Chan Kim and Renee Maborn. We explored what blue oceans are, how they differ from red oceans, and how to create value innovation. We've also learned why identifying blue oceans is more crucial than ever before, given the online environment and the interconnectedness of the world economy. Next, we'll go into more depth on how to find your blue ocean market, product, or service. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. In today's world, competition is becoming increasingly fierce. 
This leads to bloody battles among competitors who are forced to keep reducing prices while continuously spending money on incremental improvements in product quality. If they are successful at this, they will merely stay afloat in red oceans. Because other firms are doing the same, everyone is facing the risk of drowning. W. Chan Kim and Rene Maborn's Blue Ocean Strategy, How to Create Uncontested Market Space and Make Competition Irrelevant, offers a different way of doing business. In this part, we'll learn not only how to find blue oceans, but also how to avoid red ocean traps. In order to reconstruct market boundaries and move from head-to-head -head competition into a blue ocean, Kim and Maborn recommend looking across what they call six paths of value creation. Let's look at these paths. The first way to create value is through looking at an industry. A company doesn't compete only with firms in its own industry, but also with its substitutes and alternatives. Consider NetJets, now the largest private jet fleet in the world. In the corporate air travel sector, there were two choices. Business travelers could fly on a commercial airline, or a company could buy its own plane. NetJets saw a blue ocean opportunity and created a new business model in which firms could buy partial ownership of a jet. With their share, plus the cost of pilot and maintenance, they could fly on a private plane which was almost always available for some specified number of flight hours, and at a much lower cost. By offering the best of commercial travel and private jets and eliminating and reducing everything else, the authors say, NetJets opened up a multi-billion dollar blue ocean. This is Maborn speaking with Marie Forleo on Marie TV. If you want to create a blue ocean, you can't look at what people are doing in your competitive set. You need to look outside to understand how to shift what you do. A second path to value creation is through looking at the strategic group. This is a group of companies within an industry that pursue a similar strategy along two dimensions, price and performance. Most companies focus on improving their competitive position within a strategic group. For example, in the U.S. market, Mercedes, BMW, and Jaguar compete in the luxury car segment, and they're not very interested in other markets. But sometimes, a player decides to look beyond its strategic group. Toyota had long been a major player in economy cars. However, in order to attract customers from the luxury segment, it introduced its Blue Ocean brand with a different name, Lexus. The next path to creating value is to consider the buyer group. Firms within an industry generally have the same definition of who the target buyer is. However, the purchasers who pay for the product or service may be different from the users, and there might be other influencers as well. Let's think of the pharmaceutical industry. It generally focuses only on doctors who are the influencers. But Novo Nordisk, the Danish insulin producer, revolutionized the way insulin is injected by thinking of the users, the patients, rather than the influencers, the doctors. It created the Novo Pen, the first user-friendly insulin delivery solution. It solved the problem of carrying syringes and needles as well as avoiding possible social stigma. The company remains the world leader in diabetes care. Another path to creating tremendous value is to consider the scope of product. It's important to think about the context in which your product or service is used, that is, what happens before, during, and after the use. In any of these stages, some problems could occur so a potential for finding innovative solutions exists. For example, you might own a Dyson vacuum cleaner. If so, then you appreciate the advantage that it has over traditional competitors. You don't have to buy and change any bags. While Hoover or Electrolux concentrated only on the cleaning process, Dyson carefully thought about what happens before and after the process, purchasing and installing cleaner bags, and the problem that created for people. In inventing a solution, it made inroads into the $4 billion U.S. vacuum cleaner market. The company is highly profitable since its vacuums are nearly triple the price of other makers. Since Blue Ocean Strategy was written, the same industry is slowly being transformed again with autonomous vacuum cleaners such as the Roomba. Existing products try to make vacuuming easier. The Roomba takes over the job completely. Removing labor completely from the equation is genuine innovation, 
It's not just about technology, but constantly thinking about the user. A further path to value is functional or emotional appeal. As the authors put it, some industries compete principally on price and function, largely on calculations of utility. Their appeal is rational. Other industries compete largely on feelings. Their appeal is emotional. One example? How Swatch transformed the industry of functionally driven, inexpensive watches into an emotional fashion statement. Another example? The Japanese QB, Quick Beauty House, did the opposite by transforming the standard emotional appeals of an industry that offered traditional, slow haircutting rituals into something much simpler and quicker. As a result, it tapped into a large, uncontested market of busy working professionals who didn't want to waste an hour and $40 on a haircut. QB has expanded to hundreds of franchise outlets across Japan and Southeast Asia. The final path to unlock the entrance to blue oceans is looking across time. There are always some important trends, be it social, technological, legal, economic, or environmental, that have a high probability of impacting your industry. They are especially pertinent if they are irreversible and evolving in a clear trajectory, such as cloud computing or environmental protection. The key is to look across time to shape the future of your industry rather than passively react to changes as they unfold. To illustrate this, let's think of Apple's iPod. In the late 1990s, illegal music file sharing became a phenomenon. Programs such as Napster or Kazaa created a network of internet-savvy music pirates. Apple launched its iPod in 2001. An average music CD cost $19, while downloading songs from the internet was virtually free. Even people who were ready to pay for music found buying a whole album just to listen to a few songs from it prohibitively expensive, especially given the incentive to download them for free. On the other hand, Recording companies and musicians didn't want to lose their profits and were sure to engage in legal battles over copyrights. Apple's Steve Jobs observed those trends, put all the pieces together, and introduced iTunes in 2003. Partnering with five major music companies, including BMG, Sony, and Universal Music Group, Apple offered hundreds of thousands of songs for legal download for 99 cents each. It led to a staggering increase in sales of iPods, so now there were two streams of growing profits originating from the same Blue Ocean strategy. In contrast, after losing licensing lawsuits, Napster and Kazaa were forced to pay millions of dollars in fines and no longer exist. We've now discussed how to find Blue Oceans by analyzing the six paths to reconstruct market boundaries. Once you have found and formulated your strategy, it's time to execute it. Kim and Maborn introduced the term red ocean traps to refer to the mistakes that people make in formulating and executing blue ocean strategies. Perhaps the best way to understand blue ocean strategy is to look at what it is not. Firstly, it's not customer-led. On the contrary, blue ocean strategy is about finding non-customers, meaning the segments which are not currently targeted either by you or by your competitors. Your customers can't offer many insights about the people who don't buy your products or services, yet it's precisely those people who offer the greatest insights into what your industry should be doing right now, and therefore which products you should pioneer. Secondly, Blue Ocean Strategy is not about venturing beyond your core business. Although some companies, such as Virgin, have been very successful using this approach, they are the exception and not the rule. In general, such strategy is too risky because you will lack the necessary knowledge, skills, and competencies. Instead, Kim and Maborn recommend leveraging your core capabilities to reach new demand. A successful example is Nintendo with the Wii. Nintendo built on everything they had done in gaming, but came up with a product that was for the whole family, not just gamers. In the process, it found a huge new market. Thirdly, Blue Ocean thinking isn't the same as innovation on its own, or new technology, or creative destruction of existing industries. It's much broader than all these. It's based on value innovation, whose main purpose is to produce and deliver value to the customer. Innovation per se, that is simply doing something original and useful, isn't enough to capture a blue ocean. It doesn't matter how many accolades the innovation has garnered. 
Similarly, inventing new technologies isn't necessary. For example, Yellowtail or Starbucks didn't make any technological advancements. None were needed to create value innovation in making and selling wine or coffee. Instead, they offered superior value by concentrating on what their non-customers needed while reducing and eliminating everything else. Even when new technologies are used, as in the case of Apple's iPhone, the main reason why customers love the product usually isn't state-of-the-art technical specifications, but rather, as the authors put it, a leap in productivity, simplicity, ease of use, convenience, fun, and or environmental friendliness. And finally, it's not necessary to destroy an existing product to create a new one. Consider Viagra. It didn't disrupt an existing industry by displacing an older technology. It simply created a new blue ocean in lifestyle drugs. The fourth thing that blue ocean strategy doesn't require you to do is to be the first player in the market. Although this could often be an advantage, as in the case of Viagra, it isn't a requirement. Apple didn't have the first mover advantage in the markets it revolutionized. In the words of Kim and Maborn, the iMac wasn't the first PC, the iPod wasn't the first MP3 player, iTunes wasn't the first digital music store, and the iPhone certainly wasn't the first smartphone, nor, for that matter, was the iPad the first smart tablet. But what they all successfully did was link innovation to value. You could do the same. Unexplored waters can often be found within existing or even saturated red oceans. Finally, the most common mistake in understanding blue ocean strategy is equating it with differentiation, low-cost, or niche strategy. Kim and Maborn distinguish their approach from the highly influential Michael Porter of Harvard Business School. According to Porter's theory, in order to be successful, firms face three strategic choices. They can differentiate themselves from competitors by providing higher quality products, which is usually associated with higher costs. Or they could profit from cost leadership, which means being able to maintain low prices thanks to low production and operating costs, often due to economies of scale. Finally, companies could adopt a focused strategy by identifying and catering to a narrow niche of customers. According to Porter, not sticking to one of those three generic strategies will lead to problems because your company will get stuck in the middle. In total contrast, Kim and Maborn emphasize that their strategy isn't about a trade-off between differentiation and low cost, but rather about pursuing both simultaneously. Similarly, it's not about segmenting the market to find a small niche. The opposite is true. It's about finding key commonalities across buyer groups to open up and capture the largest catchment of demand. Perhaps this is the reason why it's called Blue Ocean Strategy and not merely Blue Lake or Blue Pond. Find your untapped market and demand will seem limitless. Here is Maborn on Marie TV once again. What can I eliminate and reduce that our industry has long done that no longer adds value? And what can I raise and create that we've never done before? In this part, we learned about the six paths of value creation. We also gained a clearer understanding about what Blue Ocean Strategy is and what it is not. In the next section, we'll conclude our book insight into Blue Ocean Strategy by exploring the main ways to sustain and renew it. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. In the cutthroat oceans of business and entrepreneurship, standing out and apart is a daunting task. Authors Chan Kim and Renee Mauborn recommend finding blue oceans, that is, becoming pioneers in new and untapped markets, instead of swimming in red waters replete with hungry competitors. Kim and Maborn summarize their approach by saying that the only way to beat the competition is to stop trying to beat the competition. In this part, we're concluding our book insight on Kim and Maborn's bestseller, Blue Ocean Strategy, how to create uncontested market space and make competition irrelevant. We'll learn how to renew blue oceans, then consider the book's legacy, as well as any potential criticisms. 
Think about new industries that are being created right now. Virtual reality, artificial intelligence, self-driving cars. Before long, they'll be central to the world economy. The same can be said for the internet, cloud computing, mobile phones, e-commerce. Half a century ago, they belonged to the realm of science fiction. Can you predict what industries will be invented, say, in the next 50 years, and will revolutionize the world? Probably not. Some companies and markets will become obsolete and die. Others will change and adapt, while new ones will be born. One thing is certain. There will always be chances for value innovation and growth. Here is Maborn herself speaking with Marie Forleo on Marie TV. I have clear ideas of how I can pick this low-hanging fruit, pull in new customers, and start shifting from the red to the blue. I might not create the next Apple iPod, but am I going to start moving from competing and Me Too competition to reaching out and being something different? My answer is absolutely. Successful corporations which don't find new blue ocean opportunities and reinvent themselves will sooner or later lose their market positions. To illustrate this point, let's briefly explore the evolution of the automobile industry. In the first decade of the 20th century, cars were a luxury good available only to the richest, while everyone else had to rely on horses and buggies. In 1908, there were about 500 car producers in the U.S. They all competed against one another to attract the wealthiest customers. Henry Ford identified a blue ocean opportunity and introduced the Model T, the first mass-produced car for the average person. It was standardized, durable, fast to produce, and sold for less than half the price of competing brands. It quickly became the leading car manufacturer in the U.S. By 1926, Ford had 50% of the market share. However, it failed to innovate in terms of its range and stuck with its few trusty black-painted models. With technological advancements and the rise in affluence of U.S. citizens, a blue ocean opportunity was spotted by General Motors. GM tapped into the new needs and tastes of the American customers. It introduced a broad range of models with many new colors and styles. By targeting different segments of consumers, GM's market share rose from 20 to 50%. By 1950, it had replaced Ford as the leading manufacturer. The next three decades were a red ocean period for the U.S. automobile industry. The big three held more than 90% of the market and engaged in cutthroat competition, matching one another's strategies. While they were engaging in their red ocean battles, Japanese manufacturers saw an opportunity. Whereas the accepted logic of the U.S. automakers was to compete with bringing out bigger vehicles and more luxury features, Honda, Toyota, and Datsun, now called Nissan, entered the American market and took it by storm with their small, fuel-efficient, cheaper cars. The U.S. car industry did continue to innovate. For example, in 1984, Chrysler introduced the best-selling minivan, saving the company from bankruptcy and paving the way for increased sales of minivans and SUVs. These models offered a new value to proposition, especially for families, thanks to their size, easy handling, more passenger and cargo space, and increased safety. Until minivans and SUVs came onto the market, no one really knew there was such a big market for them. The U.S. automobile industry has seen plenty of rises and falls and may be disrupted again with the rise of electric and autonomous vehicles. It's hard for any one company in any industry to continually come up with products that create blue ocean markets. According to Kim and Maborn, a company can achieve reinvention if it avoids the usual value-cost trade-offs and instead seeks to create genuinely original products that are highly profitable at the same time as being affordable and valuable to consumers. It helps when the company is protected from potential competitors by high barriers to entry, such as a strong brand, economies of scale, leading market position, or patents. We now have a good knowledge of Kim and Maborn's Blue Ocean strategy. We've taken four steps to understand how to apply this revolutionary way of strategic thinking. First, we defined Blue Ocean strategy and learned about its increasing importance in today's world. Second, we explored the six paths to finding blue oceans by looking at ways to reconstruct market boundaries. Third, 
We saw common misconceptions surrounding blue ocean strategy, and we discussed how not to fall into red ocean traps. And fourth, we learned how to renew and retain blue oceans. An example was the evolution of the U.S. car industry. The authors admit that no large company can pursue only blue ocean strategies. They say that it will always be important to swim successfully in the red ocean by outcompeting rivals. Red oceans will always matter and will always be a fact of business life. But the rewards are much greater, and it's a lot more exciting, to identify and develop blue ocean products and services. 20 years after their first meeting in In Sayad's classroom, Kim as the professor and Maborn as a student, you can feel their passion for their ideas. They know that blue ocean strategy can transform businesses, careers, and lives, and the popularity of the book is a testament to that. The blue ocean approach isn't just for business people, but has valuable insights for anyone wanting to carve out a unique space in the world and make a real contribution. Or, as Kim and Maborn put it, these ideas are not for those whose ambition in life is to get by or merely to survive. That was never an interest of ours. If you can be satisfied with that, do not read on. But if you want to make a difference, to create a company that builds a future where customers, employees, shareholders, and society win, read on. We are not saying it is easy, but it is worthwhile. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.